Okay, this week we have a special guest. He's a, he's one of these people that I've talked to in the past, but he also is a good friend of many of my friends, and so um, it was really opportune for me to be able to talk to him. Uh, he's one of the most active people in uh, sort of the experimental music scene, at least uh, in the edge of it that I occupy. Um, he's Dr. Jeff Kaiser. Um, <laughs> It, he uh, he actually pointed out that uh, the doctor was appropriate, and I was happy to use it because I'm very glad for him to now have that moniker attached to his name. Uh, Jeff, hi, how are you? Hi, uh, yeah, doctor is much better than the former reverend. Right there, you so, go. Yeah, I like that. <laughs> nice. So I there are like a million things I'd, I I'm going to want to talk to you about, but one of the things that I really enjoyed doing the podcast. And, and one of the things that really opens doors for me, just in terms of knowing the person I'm talking to, is to ask for uh, a little recap of their history, or, or what are the things that were uh, important to making them the person that they've become. So I'm going to start off this this chat with that. Tell me a little bit about where you come from, and, and what were the influences that made you what you are? Well, the, uh, the path to the, this little uh, realm of experimental music that we occupy is, is, is kind of, you know, I don't know, it's a little bit obscure, but it's, a lot of people have come to it in several uh, similar ways, I think. Um, I started out playing trumpet in the church and in school and, so, uh, and doing youth symphonies uh, and stuff like that. And at the same time, I was playing in punk rock bands. But... Uh, as a, I was pre-law at uh, Cal Poly San Luis Obispo, and I was in the middle of final exams for, I think it was like civil liber- liberties and jurisprudence or something like that, my third year, and I woke up and I go, what the heck am I doing? <laughs> uh, it was, I, just, I just felt I was going to have a heart attack by the time I was 25, living like that, you know. And I just switched to music, and I thought I was going to be a gospel musician. I was... Uh, I actually ran into and met Johnny Zell from the Lawrence Welk Orchestra, who, um, when I was in that transition space, who was just like so stoked for me. Uh, he introduced me on stage at this big concert, and and so I went to Westmont College uh, with you know pure plans on being a gospel trumpet player and musician. Um, but along the way, there was a professor there named John Rapson. Do you know John? Um, I don't chance? know. No. Uh, he's now the head of a program in Iowa, uh, at the University of Iowa, the creative music or creative, I forget what it's called, creative studies. Um, but uh, he was an experimental trombone player who worked with a lot of people who are now my friends and collaborators, uh, Vinny Gola, Golia, Alex Klein, John right. Fumo, right. a lot from the L.A. scene. Um, and, of course, I met Andrew Pask, our mutual friend, through right. Vinny Golia. Um, so John had Elliot Schwartz, uh, the experimental composer, come to school, and oh, sure. he played some stuff. And you know, I actually told him to his face that I thought it was bullshit. I mean, I, <laughs> I said that. I said that exactly. I mean, here I am, you know, raised in a suburb and playing uh, gospel music and symphonies, but well, I'm playing punk at the same time. But I thought that experimental stuff was crazy. Right. Uh, and Elliot was so kind to me. And next thing I know, John's like handing me recordings of all sorts of experimental music, but really influential was um, both electronic music that he was handing to me and um, uh, Art Ensemble Chicago and other music from the AACM, which just uh, just blew my mind. And all of a sudden, that's my life's direction. You know, I mean, it like happened quickly that I just switched. And I actually wrote Elliot a letter years later. I actually wrote, I used to publish a newsletter and I wrote a little editorial about that. And somebody read it and sent it to Elliot. And Elliot wrote to me and we had a lovely email correspondence about it. Uh, or letter, actually letter correspondence about it. And he was really cool and glad to hear from me again and stuff. So, Well, that's, that's really amazing. I had no idea you had this hidden history in gospel music, you know, because if nothing else, I would say, the music that you're doing right now is definitely not gospel music. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's well, maybe it's somebody's gospel. But well, maybe not, right, not right, that exactly. gospel. That's for right. sure. <laughs> so, um, what what is the what is the background that that has that be a reality? I mean, was it that 
Um, it was a family thing that you went to church and that music was the part of the church that you sort of connected with? Or was it a convenient way to, you know, I, I'm curious about that as well, because that's certainly my story, was that um, I was, my family was in, incredibly into, you know, heavily into the church thing and the part of the church thing that I, that I could handle and that, that spoke to me was like the music and, and the tech, the, um, audio technology and stuff. That was, that was a thing that I could, I could do when I was involved in that, that made sense to me. Uh, absolutely. I am actually so grateful. I am not a, not a person of faith, uh, you know, anymore, but, uh, that music, uh, that I was raised with in my home and at the church is, was incredibly influential. And I, I think, you know, it still resonates with me. I still write for my big band. I'll write chorales for them that'll appear in the middle of all the chaos that they do. Right. Uh, and, and I still like writing for choirs. It's one of my favorite things to write for if I'm actually composing. Uh, it was so important. And, I, and there is literally nothing but respect in my heart for the music and the musicians I was uh, raised with. Right. Well, now... <laughs> this is amazing. I, I didn't expect it to go here at all, but it's, uh, it's really neat that it has. Um, so as, as a trumpet player, you, um, you have a certain voice and a certain kind of ensemble you generally will work with. But I noticed when I was just kind of going over your, um, going over your bio, you've worked with vocal vocal groups, um, something at Ojai, I think, was, was one of them, right? That's uh, correct. My master's degree is in conducting with a uh, focus on choral uh, conducting as well as or orchestral. And that was also part of going into the church. But uh, in leaving that, I've worked with uh, the Ojai Camerata was the name of the ensemble. Yeah, that's it. And it was so fun. I mean, I commissioned new works from the likes of Wayne Pete, uh, Vinnie Golia, Stuart Liebig, Jim Connolly. And then at the same time, I'd get to conduct uh, Palestrina and uh, uh, Dunstable and Purcell and all this old stuff that I love. That's amazing. How did, uh, how did the community take to those performances? The community loved those performances. They were really well received. Um, at the time, I had... Uh, you know, I was no longer involved with the church. Now, there were performances that I did with my own choral ensembles that were uh, avant-garde, you know, experimental music performances while I was in the church, which were uh, possibly less well-received by certain people. <laughs> but <laughs> right. they're like, they call Pastor Jeff, you're doing that. <laughs> right. But uh, I, I love the music. I love the tradition. I love the sound of human voices singing together. Uh, or or solo, it's it's just uh, it's great. In fact, I'm in discussions for a new commission. I have a meeting uh, next week for a commission for uh, new choral work, which I think will involve some electronics. The same as uh, I wrote an oratorio called "Answer to Job" that was commissioned by uh, California Lutheran University yeah, yes. a few years back. Um, and uh, that involved a lot of electronics, uh, a gigantic Max patch with eight microphones going into a choir. Oh my. Uh, it's going to be a howler, I'm sure. It was. It was so fun. <laughs> when, jo yeah, when the whirlwind descends, you know, in the Book of Job, you can imagine what all the audio hell that broke loose. It was wonderful. <laughs> right. Of all the things Max was probably perfectly created for, that sounds just about to be right down the center of it. You know. Oh. Uh, it's pretty yeah. rough when the center, when your center line comes from the Book of Job. But yeah. <laughs> there you go. I guess it'll have to work. Yeah. So, um, what was what led to the exodus away from doing uh, uh, church and, and religious music? Well, um, actually, Carl Jung probably, uh, <laughs> but <laughs> as much as anything. everyone blames him for everything, right? <laughs> I love Carl Jung so much, <laughs> but you know, uh, when I when I uh, went to I went back to school, I, I left him behind for other writers, but he. You know, as much as anything, but it was a, a, a slow realization that it was not the place for me. And uh, when I left it, I just dove into music full time, and uh, that became my thing. Uh, you know, it, I was fortunate to be able to do that, and and it's been a blast ever since. Yeah, no doubt. Well, now, um, 
I'm a little bit confused about um, about the educational path because you've got your doctorate, but I, in some cases, you're you're you know you really self describe as a performer. In other cases, you and and even just you know a couple of sentences ago, you uh, you self describe as either a conductor or a band leader. You're late, you know. You've done label, but you've also talked about yourself as an ethnomusicologist. Um, which of those represents like your educated reality? Um, my or educated your, reality, your academic reality is what I should have said. My <laughs> academic reality. Um, you know, uh, I was fortunate enough to get my PhD recently, and I had a you know a, a hiatus between my a long hiatus between my masters and my uh, PhD, where I was you know a professional musician was mm-hmm. my uh, main activity. Right. Um, so I really embrace the idea of the artist scholar um, in in the, as the reality of who I am right now. It's very hard for me to think of them as distinct activities, though. You know, you definitely you code switch when you're hanging out with musicians. You'll use one set of you know one language, and when you're hanging out with academics, you might switch to another language. <laughs> certainly, you know. Certainly. Now it <laughs> seems I, like music schools are a little bit more embracing of that than others. I think. You know, um, or maybe I'm wrong. I mean, what's what's your feeling about that? I think it seems to be a pretty recent phenomenon. I mean, the program I'm in, excuse me, I graduated from, was found by the wonderful, well, one of the founders was the wonderful artist scholar, George Lewis. Right. Um, and he's a, he's a big model. I mean, uh, he's just, you know, really uh, embodies that. Though I understand, I don't think he's playing... Uh, trombone anymore. I heard from somebody that said he's really focusing on writing and uh, his text and composing. But he was really influential. And of course, you know, then in the program I graduated from, David Borgo, who's written books and you know right. recorded albums. Right. Yeah. But there's definitely so I like I like that hybrid artist scholar, you know, sure. uh, moniker. But it's you know it's like there's not a single word for that right now. There isn't. You're right, and in fact, I think sometimes, um, sometimes the the kind of academics that can be described with a single word are either intimidated or just plain don't like people that are trying to push boundaries like that. Oh yeah, I mean, and you had a recent sojourn into academia as well, right? I was very late to the whole academic world. And um, so I just recently got my master's, and the way that that played out, I was uh, I took a very thoughtful approach, which was to go to a school that um, embraced media arts as sort of a general case program, and also to make sure that the thing that I was interested in studying and pursuing was different than any of the other academicians there. Uh, so that I could kind of mark my own path rather than having to follow someone else's particular lead. Nice. It worked out very well for me, you know. I think that's, you know, that's pretty similar. The integrative studies, uh, formerly known as critical uh, studies and experimental practices, Mm -hmm. has a lot of room. I mean, I went in planning to be, you know, you were allowed multiple area or you're a major area of focus and then multiple areas underneath that. And I plan in going and focusing on creative practice, performing, composing, etc. Right. I ended up focusing on ethnomusicology because I met Nancy Guy there, who's uh, uh, just a wonderful scholar and a delightful human being, and David Borgo, of course, both of whom are ethnomusicologists. Right. And I, I like, realized this is, this. it really resonated with me, and I'm like, oh, you know, I've already got a background in creative practice. Why not try something different? Right, right. I didn't know what I was in for. It turns out writing a dissertation is very difficult. Uh, I would rather write an opera than a dissertation, given the choice. <laughs> yeah, well, I think if nothing else, uh, an, an opera has the opportunity to be expanded uh, by performance, where uh, a dissertation is nothing more than, than getting closed in by the very words you chose, right? Right, and then... Uh, and then it, you know, it's a it's a weird uh, process of closing in, opening up, closing in as you meet with advisors, and then the defense 
you know, is also, uh, but my defense was a joy. It was an opening up, but it's like, yeah, you get closed in by these words and right. then you go to the defense and they make you realize all these other areas you can go. It's weird, but you end up having a fixed, you know, you end up with a fixed product. Um, right. Indeed. Now, some people that I know have taken their dissertation and used it as an opportunity to sort of like expand on the concept. Other people, their dissertation represents the last time they ever want to talk about that subject again, right? Which was it for you? Um, excuse me, just drinking some tea there. Sure. Um, uh, for me, it is definitely, I want to write a book based on it. It's not the final say uh, from my perspective, or is it, I think, uh, I mean, it's a great compilation of, of interviews. The inter people I interviewed were wonderful um, the d dissertation is called Improvising Technology, Configuring Identities and Interfaces in Electroacoustic Music. Typical, you know, dissertation, very long. You have to take a breath in the middle of it, the title. Of you the know. title, right. Yeah, it's like, but um, I interviewed people from Nels Klein of Wilco to Wadada Leo Smith to Robert Henke of Ableton uh, about, you know, their use of technology. And there's some really wonderful quotes in there. And I want to tease out more information and... I felt that if I had had another six months to write, it would have been really good. But I, I mean, it was it was fine enough as is, obviously, to pass. But uh, it's not my not the last thing I have to say on it, and I really hope to get a book out of it. Well, the the concept of taking a taking an ethnomusicologist's view of technology is something that hasn't been done very much. And I think it's it's maybe a little problematic because things are changing incredibly fast, and and uh, preferences become old hat, become a cliche, and then come back around as uh, a warm remembrance incredibly fast now. And um, but it doesn't seem like there's very many people that are focusing on documenting as it goes through that progression. Uh, yeah, I mean, and you're one of the people that are doing that. I'm, I started a little. <laughs> yeah, I mean, with this, this podcast. You oh, have, with the podcast, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, it is a, you know, it is a, an ethnographic work. Yeah, that's you know, true, it, that's true. It's maybe not as strictly defined by anthropologists and some ethnomusicologists, you know. There's always this debate between, you know, journalism versus, you know, some veneer of objectivity that, the academy might present but you know most people don't buy that objectivity stuff anymore <laughs> right well i'm i'm also trying not to sleep with any of the people that i'm interviewing so oh, that makes me <laughs> there's such a such a history in ethnomusicology of uh, people that will remain uh, anonymous at this point but uh, yeah how to how to get information from your your interviewees sleep with them uh, get them drunk That's get them high right, you know exactly. it's like <laughs> yeah, you know, so I'm keeping this barrier of Skype between me and anyone on the other end of the microphone line, so that should that should work out positively. So what? Yeah. Uh, so you you named some of the people that you talked to in, in terms of like uh, this concept of of um, of your behind your dissertation, but the long take a breath name in the middle of it uh, title doesn't necessarily really make it clear what exactly you're looking into. Is it is it mostly that you're looking into how technology has changed people's approach to music making? It's kind of both. It's I mean it's a you know it's an ethnographic examination of how artists both conceptualize their relationship with technology, but also how the technology possibly configures them to work in certain ways. Which would which, which caused some really interesting debates in the interview process, um, you know, so it's artists, we, we all like talking about how we conceptualize our relationship with our tools, how we work with them, how we view it. But when you say, so what does the tool, you know, d does the tool make you do things or something like, you know, it's like artists go, go really hot and cold on that, you know? So, <laughs> yeah, well, not only did it, a, a lot of times just even talking about it'll freeze them in place. You know, it's just, there's not a lot of love talking about the gear being a creative tool or whatever. 
Yeah, or had, giving some agency to the interaction. I mean, so much of, of the Western art music tradition is the artist is in charge of everything. Mm -hmm. um, but this, is, of course, has begun to change. And, you know, many people would talk about their the technology, you know. It's it's difficult when you start, because I, I tend to go, I don't know if you know this, the, the soci social uh, scientist uh, theorist uh, Bruno Latour, but I tend to go into his direction where, you know, the, humans and other things are all um, participating and associated with agency. And so, you know, some artists, I, you know, I say, well, does this affect the way you play this piece of equipment? And some would be like, oh, no, not at all. And others would be like, oh, oh absolutely. Wadada Leo Smith has this wonderful, uh, at, talks at length of the Wawa pedal, how when his foot touches it, uh, the pedal knows he's touching it and uh, you know, and there's this like two way communication going on. You know, it's like the, it's, yeah, so it's, you know, it's, it's, it's different people, you know, conceptualize it different ways. Right. Well, let's talk a, a little bit about how that might work for you because you are a, um, you're a trumpet player, which, you know, has this potential of being. Uh, relatively technology-free, other than the obvious technology of the trumpet. But you certainly wrap your arms around all kinds of technology. And you also, one of the things I notice is you are, you're one of the people that, that I know of that goes way out of their way to put together interesting duets or interesting combos. And, uh, I don't know if it's whether to push yourself or push the other person or what the what the goal behind it is, but you find a way to sort of like interact with a lot of people, many of whom are very technology uh, based in their work, right? It's it's very important to me to to keep uh, mixing it up, and duos are are just one of the joys of my life because it's like they're usually fairly easy to plan. You don't have to get a big old doodle doc out to plan the dates and stuff you right. know but um you know the the choice of who to work with is you know it really you know works into like how i mean i consider myself an improviser and a composer and most of my duos in fact all of them that i can think of are all well some of the brad dudes is composed but it's mostly you know improvised and if not entirely improvised and uh, so the the selection of a partner is like super important from Gregory Taylor to uh, David Borgo to Andrew Pask, Thomas McNally, Woody Applenalp, um, you know, uh, it just keeps going, Nicholas Deo. Uh, but, you know, it, it keeps it, it keeps it always surprising to me and it always pushes me and makes it enjoyable and new. Um, and I always pick people I like talking with, too, to play with, because I find that that's like, you know, you can always tell a good improviser, usually, not all the time, but if by the conversation you have with them. Sure, sure. I mean, I, I do, I view, you know, uh, improvisation as a, a live, interactive construction, you know, that's taking place, and where we're not only constructing ourselves, but we're constantly being informed with possibilities as how to proceed with the construction by the environment, the partners we're working with, the technology we're working with. All this is informing us as well as us being a participant in the creation of it. It's this big, you know, feedback loop. Right. Now, one of the things I would say, though, when, when I listen to the work that you've done with some of the people whose work I know very well, so like Gregory Taylor, for example, um, I would say that in collaboration with him, the conversation that you create or the conversation you have or the construction you build is very different from what he would do alone um, and kind of represents represents your bringing aggression to the table. I'll just put it that way because <laughs> I don't know how else to put it. We, you know, I don't know a kinder way to put it that still will leave the impression to the listeners about exactly what's happening there. I feel like you have a very aggressive kind of style, an aggressive ear, right? And when you work with people who might tend towards the more ambient, you draw them into that and draw an energy out of them that's very unique. Now, why, first of all, what is it about you that, 
has that sort of aggressive nature? I mean, is it something that you, you've ever intellectualized? Well, um, absolutely. Uh, I mean, I'd like to talk about Carl Jung again. <laughs> 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 no, maybe not. Um, but, you know, it, it goes back. Uh, I view a lot of it is, you know, we're so influenced by the things we do when we're young that we find joyful and we still look for the joy of those things and uh you know i did symphonic work but i was also playing in punk bands in the late 70s and early 80s um and i just loved that uh, ability to just get it all out you know just to just to get it all out on stage to be uh you know uh, banging away at the over amplified guitar with feedback and just letting things just explode. You know, I just really enjoyed that. And I, I got to admit, I still have some of that, um, that, it, that, that sort of punk aggressiveness. Uh, I really enjoy that. And there's usually one place a set that I let it unleash. Um, mm -hmm. I try to limit it, um, because it can, it can be a little off putting, but other people really enjoy it because I also, you know, like it, the Desert Fathers. So if you take a listen to our last album, which, you know, by the way, streams uh, entirely for free on my uh, website, jeffkaiser.com. Um, and you listen to a track, one of my favorite tracks uh, called Pietas. Um, it starts out with this like sh uh, shifting, morphing trumpet chorale that's built up in layers, you know, one after another. And, and uh, you know, Max, I'm just throwing things into buffers and letting them phase in and out of relationships with each other. Sure. So, I, I mean, if you want to intellectualize it, it's like all, you know, there's the church and the punk side by side in that one track. <laughs> right, right. You know, so. <laughs> yeah, it's actually funny that you point that out because, and, and maybe you could tell by my uh, statements that that's, that's something I had been just listening to just before we initiated this call, so. Oh, actually, I didn't know that. That's, yeah, that's cool. indeed. Right. It's so, one of the more I mean, recent ones, so I, I really like it a lot. It's a, We recorded that at, you know, Stein in Amsterdam, and it's just, that album is so full of just, you know, I, I'm not only happy with the sound of it, but every time I listen to it, I have memories of us hanging out in Amsterdam, Gregory and I. Right. Uh, right. Yeah. That sounds like fun. One of the things that I find interesting is how little of the punk aesthetic has actually, even even though it had, you know, the the creative work uh, was initially done long, long ago, how little of that seems to have made it into either the academic canon or uh, or any sort of uh, experimental music. I, I'm not sure why that is. And about the only other place I actually am starting to see it a little bit is in sort of the outgrowth of music coming from the modular synth wor world, um, yeah. where there's really a preference for noisy and very mechanical sounding riffs rather than you know, sweet melodies. Um, but I'm, I'm really surprised that that hasn't become a bigger part of our, uh, our discussion on the experimental side of it. Certainly in the pop realms, uh, punk was, uh, was embraced, co-opted and, uh, recycled into green day or whatever and uh, turned into popular music. But it seems like that aesthetic has just not made it into uh, the experimental music world nearly as much as I thought it would have. Yeah, I mean, part of me wants to to blame the uh, aspects of the Academy as being about perpetuating, you know, the ways of work and people protecting their their worlds of work, you know, uh, their or their realms, you know, by not letting people with those aesthetics in. Right, um, right. But I, I think that's less and less so. I think that they're, you know, we're starting to see more and more that the academy is needing to open their door to uh, to people with wider views, or the people themselves can get in the door without sharing those views, and then are able to, uh, you know, unleash them within the academy. I think uh, so. We have a lot of younger composers. I think that get, that bring uh, a lot of that with them, and and stuff. And of course, improvisation in the academy was at 
odds for a long time as well. Well, I think I think that even talking about the academy as sort of a singular entity might be giving it more due than it's than it deserves. I think <laughs> so. I, I I shouldn't have. I hope. Yeah, I shouldn't have even uh, said it. I just like there are certain institutions, you know, which really have worked at perpetuating certain ideas. But you know, the academy is a, a lot more wide open. I'll I'll say when I first my first round of applications for PhD, which uh, came before me just giving up, is that I, I chose quite a few places and you know was very honest about my influences and what I wanted to do and. Uh, I got so many reply letters that said the same thing. You know, there's a rejection, and then they'd all, you know, say, "Have you thought about Cal Arts?" Oh my! You know? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I had that so many times. And, That's hilarious. Um, yeah, and I I love Cal Arts, but I already had a master's degree, and that was all they were offering at the time. Right, right. Um, but uh, yeah, so yeah, I should not speak of a monolithic academy. Of course, there is great diversity within well, yeah, in programs. Well, yeah. there is, and I mean, there are. There is a pretty lot of real estate in the in music academia for certain that still seems to be struggling with whether a saxophone is a proper instrument or not, right? Boy, and <laughs> yeah, there 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 are places, you know, where that's still going on or, you know, or even certainly and much less so a laptop, right? right? Yeah, well, and and the concept of improvisation as something worthy of study still gets, you know, get squinty eyes from people they they aren't certain that that's something that's really an academic pursuit certainly but i mean that's that's that was the way it was that started to that's really changed uh you know there we've got the oxford companion to improvisation coming out right. uh we've got all these volumes on it and i i remember when i first got here i asked george lewis something about improvisation uh versus Composition. He just looks at me. And goes, "Are people still having that conversation?" <laughs> <laughs> right on. Yeah. I hear and you. I was like, "Oh, George, thank you for yeah." It was all in my head right. on one level. That said and done, there are places that still, you know, you know, don't want to welcome that discussion. You know. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that there's actually a lot of places, and you know, maybe that that serves that serves some purpose. But um, it's exciting to me to sort of see the see the track that you've made for yourself. I find that I find it exciting because to me it represents kind of a a hope in a cool potential future, right? Someone who embraces technology, who embraces while simultaneously embracing virtuosity on instrument, um, someone who is equally at home Doing work via digital streaming as well as live, uh, live work. It's in a way you're kind of you kind of represent a, a great option for a modern Renaissance person. Well, thank you. From uh, your lips to search committees' ears. <laughs> right there, you go. <laughs> but I think it's. I mean, I just think it's it's hopeful. And and as as your career continues, I you know I'm. I'm hoping that opens doors and opens eyes for other people to also look at it as, you know, having this the, this kind of artist-scholar uh, perspective. But with, yeah. with sort of like technology being a part of that, of both the artist and the scholar side of it. Yeah, yeah I really, really hope so. I mean, when I read... David Borgo's book and was it when did it come out? Two thousand and six, Sink or Swarm. I kind of like felt this great hope for the musical world. I I don't want to you know exaggerate you know, for at least for the world as I knew it. It's like I'll hear with somebody writing about these things, you know, all the things that concern me all at once. You know, right. improvisation, technology, instruments, you know. Uh, and stuff. I don't know if you've read that text, but I haven't. I mean, yeah, but it's already. I, I just, uh, I just uh, looked it up online for a quick for a quick pickup because it sounds like something that I need to read. Well, and he would, you know, he would quickly also recommend some of his uh, uh, more uh, his recent articles where he's kind of updated or not updated, uh, developed some of these ideas. 
Um, they can be found on JSTOR or his, uh, I think probably on his webpage, I imagine, davidborgo.com. But he's like been, you know, really, uh, the only word is inspirational that somebody can do all of this stuff together. Right. You know, and to, and he writes really well. I just looked at a chapter he's sending out and I'm like, oh my God, I want to write like this, you know. <laughs> um yeah, so there, there is, you know, there is hope. And then when you, and th- there's some really interesting texts out there. Gary Peters' Philosophy of Improvisation, I've really enjoyed. Um, there's this other one, oh, Improvisation, oh, what the heck is it? Uh, God, what is the name of the author? I cannot remember for the life of me, but it's a wonderful take that includes views of improvisation going back to the, the classical music era to contemporary and stuff. Well, it sounds, it sounds really, really. I'm gonna have to dig into some of this. Uh, yeah. Get back into reading. I don't know. Lately, it seems like I've been. Um, well, you know, if you could see my desk, it's some combination of circuit boards, printed out instructions for compiler options. It's just a mess. So I'm afraid I'm in that one part of my life where I don't get to read very much. <laughs> I hate I, that I, part. Yeah, I, I'm sitting here in a. In a big, big mess myself. How by many, the way, the book the book is by Edgar Landgraf. It's called Improvisation as Art. Um, one of the things that is really changing a lot in the whole music, especially I would say the experimental scene, because it's kind of taking longer than in other scenes, is uh, the change in how we create uh, musical artifacts. And um, I bring this up because uh, among the many things that you've done, uh, you have been the owner, creator of an extremely prolific uh, music label uh, called PF Mentum. Uh, we were kind of talking a little bit before the podcast about the pronunciation of it, but we're going to go with PF Mentum because that's probably the easiest thing for people to spell and look up on the internet. In talking about uh, doing a label, first of all, how, like how many releases have you done? It's some extraordinary number. Uh, it it started it's starting to surprise me. I think we've got like uh, eighty eight. Number eighty eight is going to press then this next week. Unbelievable. And um, some of them feature your work, but there's a lot of work by others. How do you choose who is going to be um, embraced by your label? Well, um, it's kind of you know an interesting. It's a. Uh, you know, and I have had lawyers involved with this along the way for different things, and one of them referred to it as a non-business model model, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, or as, yeah, something like that, um, because it really is uh, um, kind of a it, it is like a, I ca- I refer to it as a curated collective, and the curation comes through really through the artists kind of seek us out that that resonate with what we're doing. And um, then myself and Luis Lopez listen to it. I mean, we're, we're after a couple things. We're after, um, we're really after people that are incorporating improvisation and, uh, you know, that maybe ha- hopefully have some unique uh, way or idiosyncratic look at music. Um, but we're also looking for something that's recorded well and is, uh, is something that's going to be interesting to listen to on multiple levels. Right. So it's a, it's a, there is not like a, I could not pull up a Google doc that says uh, selection methodology, you know, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it, it, it really kind of sorts itself out as people that seek us out with similar, especially more so now. There's a constant stream um, and it's, it's difficult. I just don't have enough hours in the day because it's definitely a labor of love, not of profit. Right. Um, yeah. And we still do objects, too, which is really weird. And that also um, s- helps sort people out as well because a lot of people just want to do digital releases now. But we like doing objects, and we're branching into uh, cassette tapes and vinyl, which seems like the opposite of the industry. Yeah, you're going the opposite way, but I think that's actually really cool because, first of all, creating those objects sort of – I mean, there's – there's something about that that makes it seem like more of a uh, definitive effort, right? I th- I think so, and that that kind of um, 
like I said, I, what was I? That's, that's kind of a self selection thing for who wants to release as well because there are people approaching that just want to do digital and we say no we want to do objects and there you know there is you know this there is a cost associated that will be shared uh, by the artist right you know and so that, that kind of like tells you the person that wants to invest money uh it, you know <laughs> they're and frequently you know all of us labor at different jobs very few of us are making uh much money off this kind of music sure uh you know this this uh shows the people that really are interested and in believers you know for lack of a better word in this project uh that we're doing you know getting the music out there right now in addition to object flow you do have some things that are uh, I know it's the one De Desert Fathers album is a streaming only album. What when do you decide to do that? Is it like when you run out of physical media? <laughs> uh, exactly. So oh, the, really? the 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 first <laughs> the first uh, uh, Desert Fathers album, Coptic Icons, is streaming uh, only, and you can buy that on Bandcamp. Uh, we we did a limited run on that and ran out pretty quickly. But the the current one is still available on CDs. Um, we did experiment with one all digital release, and I think it's. I mean, I played on it, and you know, I don't play on. I think you know, Michael. At this point, Michael Vlakovich, Vlakovich, might have more releases out on PF Menem than I do. Oh, really? You know, um, he's been very prolific lately. But um, so we tried a purely digital release, and uh, we couldn't get radio play or reviews at the same level. And I mean, it was well recorded, a very nice studio. Uh, I played on it. Ted Burns, the wonderful drummer, and uh, Tom McNally on guitar, um, and it just we couldn't get play. And we just find out if we send CDs to the radio stations, we'll get play, you know. And it also ups the amount of reviews we'll get. We got, you know, a couple, a handful of reviews for that one. But when we send CDs out, we get reviewed. Oh, that's so. interesting. That I think. You know, it's important to consider because if you if you would follow some people's suggestions for how to put together, um, you know, some sort of career or portion of your career that's related to doing to doing music, the the idea of making physical artifacts seems to have gone out. You know, their their suggestion would be you'd be better off making T-shirts now. I'm not sure that people are going to be dying for Choir Boys T-shirts any anytime <laughs> soon. But um, it's I think I actually think it's really interesting to find out what are the positive gains in having physical media. And certainly the the review thing is something I think, if nothing else, you put yourself in the reviewer's seat. And if you get a snow, if you get a like an avalanche of emails, and then you get some physical media, which is the one that feels like something that you could actually that you actually want to accomplish. I mean, a thing that you can hold in your hand uh, certainly has, it seems like it has more psychic weight in some way. Yeah, it is, it is. you know, um, it is one of those things. I mean, in the digital world, it's like, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's much easier to get lost. I mean, the physical world, it's easy to get lost. There's so many CDs out there, so many cassette tapes and albums out there. But it it's it's like much easier to get pushed down an email, you know, to do list than it is, you know, if something's in your hand, like you said. And, you know, that is part of the reason we do this. I mentioned it's a labor of love. There's not a big profit. But, you know, our main goal is to help the artists get their music out there to be heard and shared out in the world. Um and you know, this results in you know, other benefits, gigs and et cetera. Right. right. But and we yeah. Yeah, but the but the the you know the best way we have found to be heard and reviewed is physical objects. So. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Now, when I looked over uh, your bio, um, something came up that I wanted to make sure to ask you. Um, you seem to work with a lot of kind of. Um, bizarre groupings. So we talked about you doing some solo stuff and doing duets. Um, but what is, you know, I, I think some of them are, are pretty clear. So a double quartet is a pretty obviously, uh, pretty obvious grouping, but I have no idea what a aqua deck tet might be. 
And um, yeah, and I know from talking to others and talking to Andrew, who you've you've kind of uh, drawn into some of these larger ensembles, you put together some really strange groupings of players. Why don't you kind of cover some of them for me, and then particularly why you would choose certain groupings for certain kinds of work? Yeah, the uh, the Aco Dectet was originally the octo dectet which is just a playful way of saying 18 i don't think it's actually saying that but then i don't know what i just came up with this name and then i was making the posters and i realized oh there's only 17 people in this group <laughs> the first time so i mean it's one of those things that i was a goofball to begin with i mean pf mantam i obviously you know like playing with the sound of words and so i just said oh we'll call it the octo dectet and everybody'll say what is that you know so I, I didn't want to call it the Jeff Kaiser Large Ensemble because there's already the longstanding Vinnie Golia uh, yep. Large Ensemble, right. and I I didn't want to I almost I didn't want to call it an orchestra because that has uh, other connotations, and I didn't want to call it the big band because I didn't want to create expectations as to what the sound would be. Right, right. Um, so yeah, I just went with a made-up name, uh, and uh, it sounds real though, doesn't it? It does. Well, and it's interesting <laughs> that you bring up this idea of, of uh, certain things having expectations. I, I was trained as a guitarist, and the instrument, I my hands are kind of getting messed up now, so I can't play as much as I used to be able to. It's, it's really unfortunate, but nevertheless, um, that's the instrument I have the most facility with, but um, I find that I really don't like pulling it out at a gig because having a guitar in your hand is loaded with expectations and what the the concept of virtuosity on on a guitar represents something very specific um you i'm sure run into that sometimes with uh when you uh pull out a trumpet right oh yeah um but I think that there's not an expectation behind an aco tat and so that probably does give you some freedom to go whatever direction you chose you chose to well how do you how do you combat especially and I would say especially with your solo stuff with solo performance how do you strike the concept of what people's expectation is of a trumpet I mean I got around it by saying I'm not taking the guitar to the gigs I I've got my little modular synthesizer and since nobody has any clue what that's supposed to sound like, I get away with doing what I like, right? But I can't seem to do that with a guitar, or at least feel comfortable doing it. Well, it, it's something, uh, and I'm not going to be one of those modernist type that says, I don't listen to the audience expectations. I don't take that <laughs> into consideration. I don't buy that. I think we I have these voices, these voices inside our head, and to deny them is to be delusional. Uh, that these things are all inside our head. But um, it's funny because uh, I, I play with this, I got this group called Trumpet Trumpet with Dave Ballou, uh, on the uh, who's at Towson University. And uh, we do trumpet duos with, uh, and then we each run our uh, trumpet through Max Patches. And um, he's a, he's a, you know, a, uh, a serious virtuoso. Uh, he's played with everybody from Steely Dan to Broadway, long-running Broadway shows and all that stuff. Um, so, I mean, he's got some strong cred. And, you know, uh, I'm not a Dave Ballou, but I've got some good cred, too. I've played film scores and, you know, done all that stuff. Um, and, uh, you know, sometimes it's pretty funny. Like, people go, wow, you really can't play the trumpet after all, <laughs> you know, after hearing me make whatever sounds it is I make with it. But... um we run across this this it always startles me to run across this preconception that people have or this 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 these preconceived ideas that they bring to the trumpet so dave and i played at the new school um as part of the uh, at the new school in new york in june as part of the uh isim the international society for improvised music conference right and we're, you know, we got the microphones stuck inside the bell, so you're, you know, the trumpet at some point becomes more of an LFO than anything <laughs> else, you know. Uh, and it's, uh, 
but no, we're really playing the horn. But this this guy raises his hands and asks. He goes, "Hey, you guys, that what are you doing is really neat, but you know, I can't hear the trumpet. Can you fix that?" <laughs> you know. But you know what I told him is, I say, you know, I don't view this that I'm playing trumpet. I view it as I'm playing this hybrid instrument that has all of this technology. You know, technology is just you know the tools and techniques used by a, a a culture for you know at a certain time or whatever and so the trumpet is a technology and it's hybrid with the electronics the way i'm the way i'm using it i don't view it as you know uh, some people might view it as a like putting a mute in it just changes the timbre of the trumpet but you're still playing the trumpet right you know but i view it as this whole you know hybrid instrument you know that it, it, it's it's not. I'm not playing the trumpet. I'm playing this thing, whatever it's called. Right. Yeah, I hear that. So, yeah. The yeah. So if you think of, I mean, I just spent a little time with uh, Jane Regler, a, a, a local person who focuses on extended. Actually, I'm going to be interviewing her next week for the podcast. But she focuses a lot on extended techniques on the flute. And we she, played together last spring, actually, oh, in did San you? Diego. Oh, okay. Yeah, she's wonderful. Yeah, she's an amazing player. I, I've seen her play a couple of times, and it just I still find it shocking uh, every time. But um, she's a person now who's looking at technology, particularly really creative uses of Ableton Live, to uh, sort of create a new extended, extended technique, if you would, uh, that... You know, but for her, it still it still represents kind of an extension of the flute. Where it sounds like you're saying, you're really thinking this as as representing a completely new instrument. Yeah, in fact, um, and I have a lot of friends, and so that that use the term extended technique. Um, but I actually don't like the term. Mm. Um, and I I totally know why we use it, and every now and then I use it too. And I mean. You know, very great, thoughtful players use that term. But I, I started to think about it, and I, I actually talked about this in, in a lecture and, and uh, I, at CalArts a while ago. It was kind of, I don't know, I don't view it as extended technique. If it's on the instrument, it's idiomatic. It's part of the instrument. Ex extended is creating this hierarchy of that's privileging certain traditions and right. certain ways of playing. Right. And so... I, I think it's all trumpet playing. So I do split tones. When I'm playing acoustically, I'll do split tones, multiphonics, you know, different types of tonguing, slap tonguing and stuff. I don't view any of that as extended, but it's actually idiomatic. Right. I see. Okay. Yeah, but 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 I, I do I, I but I know why it's being used too. I know why the term is used. Um but well, yeah. well, thanks for spanking me down there, uh, Jeff. No, no, <laughs> uh, no, man, I no, 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 because everybody uses that term, and I, I, I do at times too. But I've started, to, I've started like trying to decide. I think it's, it's the the word extended is is privileging a base tech, a base level of technique. That's true. That that's yeah. really true. Yeah. Um, um. So no, no spanking down intended, Darwin. It's it's just <laughs> something I I like to talk about because I don't think we I don't think it's one of those things that just is such a part of our vocabulary as musicians that we don't examine it and. Uh, I, I, you know, I got lots of unexamined areas. <laughs> well, <laughs> right, own. but now, yeah. and I've I've already used up a lot of your time. But let me just let me just run down one more thing with you, which is based off of what you just said. This 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 desire, this like need to examine things. I think in all cases, it's really easy for us once something becomes once you hear something five times, say. It's easy to then kind of very loosely use that phrase as if it's normed, right? It's, you know, so I, I hear people talk about extended technique long enough. I'm willing to say, well, extended technique, it's a real thing because it's got a word behind it, right? Yeah. Many of the things that are happening right now in music don't have names behind them and hence on one hand, maybe that's nice because it means that we haven't boxed it in yet. But on the other hand, it means that it can't be it can't be easily talked about. It can't be described. We can't since since there's not a common vocabulary for it. It's not something we can talk about. It's not something we can study or critique very well. Where what is the limits of 
vocabulary, both in the good, in the positive and negative ways. I mean, you're as an ethnomusicologist that's that's looking at currency. It must be really difficult to have to talk about things that don't have names. It it is, and uh, yeah, it is difficult, and it's you know one of the uh, sometimes the desire is to come is you know to coin some new word for these things. Uh, I try to like keep from doing that, but um, well, that used to be the currency of a of an academic was if you were the person that named a thing, then you had some kind of value. Yeah, it's kind of like yeah, going back to the Old Testament. It's like uh, Adam naming the animals. That's right. Gave, gave him power. But you know what? I was just thought about this quote from Joel Ryan. Do you know Joel? Um, heard the name. I don't. I don't know him jo- personally. Uh, he he's in uh, um, he's in Evan Parker's uh, electroacoustic ensemble. Okay. And and he's also been in, in associated with Stein since the right. 80s. I That's believe. probably where I would have heard of yeah. him. But he has this, I got this quote from an interview with him, and it's like right in front of me, so I can just like, it's just a short one. He says, in music, we are still under the sway of semiotics and language philosophy, which I think is pernicious because it always degrades what musicians know about music and elevates some sort of symbolic representation concept of music. So the representation becomes more important than the stuff of music. Hmm. The representation is just a tool, and it's true that writing can liberate possibilities, but it always has to reflect back to the meat of music, to the wet meat of music. <laughs> oh, nice. <laughs> I love that quote. And That's excellent. Joel is just so incredibly thoughtful. I felt so, uh, you know, it was really wonderful to interview him. But um, I think, you know, that... Uh, I think that as we examine these things more and more, uh, these uh, the they will gonna, we're going to start to come up with terms, but we need to keep pointing it back to music, also to experiential knowledge, so that we don't um, overplay some some uh, you know written knowledge or something like that. But we you know we value experiential knowledge, and that uh, there is frequently uh, an inability to express uh, experiential knowledge in words. Right. Or at least a great difficulty. And this is the bane of all musicologists and ethnomusicologists. How do we talk about something that's one, uh, you know, one mode of understanding music with another mode of understanding words, you know, which are your words, you know? Well, and it's, you know, I think even the things that we're trying to study, the things that ethnomusicologists like yourself are having to study, um, can't survive being documented. I mean, it used to be, you know, I, when I was kind of dipping my toe in it, I would go and look at, you know, when people would go and study um, some Javanese thing, you know, they would be able to write out the rhythmic, uh, rhythmic patterns that were in use. And, you know, you know that they weren't exact, but at least they could convey the message, right? Right. How do you... Uh, how do you, as uh, how would you document now a DJ who occasionally hits the table to cause the needle to skip, to build in a certain amount of chance into uh, the performance that uh, he's doing, you know, or or someone who uses a mass patch to uh, very liquidly manipulate the tonality of the thing while they're playing. How do you, how do you even approach talking about that in any, in any way and marry it to the work that anyone else is doing? I don't yeah. know. I don't know. I'm curious. I'm curious if what you see as the people that are trying to break down or trying to break that down in a way that's useful from a historical standpoint. Well, you know, and, there's this idea of this thick description where you you describe what's happening and you try to really get into it. And I, I like that idea of, you know, uh, just that, just that, even that, that phrase, thick description. It's a cool, uh, cool phrase. Yeah. And so, you know, uh, Maria Chavez, who is, uh, I interviewed, and uh, she's a DJ who, you know, are you familiar with her work? She's in New York. No, I'm not. Um, and so she puts objects on the turntable and, you know, uses all sorts of rounded off needles that are going to skip all the way. And the only way to, to describe that is to 
uh, is through poetry and metaphor, I think. You mm-hmm. know, poetry, metaphor, um, you can go into technical description, but that's not going to get it. Um, but then to, you know, to not privilege the written word or the notated word in the case of those that notated or that would work at notating uh, gamelan music or uh, different music from, um, you know, the continent of Africa. Uh, uh, Kofi Agawu has this book about, uh, you know, the difficulty in representing these musics through notation and, and words and stuff. It's really interesting. But, um, yeah, I think that, that we need to, you know, include recordings, video documentation, uh, I think this needs to be all a part of it, and that the you know the tr- tradition of the dissertation being a written word. I think you know we're seeing a lot of mo- more emphasis on the digital humanities, which I think are, you know are you know uh, better at documenting this stuff because they will inc- include video, audio, and stuff like that. Right. And I I actually videotaped all the interviews and performances of many of the artists and stuff, and I I would. If given the time, I mean, I would like to, if I create a book with this, I would like to include those things with it um, because I think it just informs, you know, it, it gives a more uh, a, 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 a more full description of what's going on than words only. Sure. Well, Jeff, I want to thank you so much for taking the time to talk with me today. It was a, it was a blast. We kind of... I think I had a list of questions here somewhere, but I immediately hit the eject button as soon as we, uh, as soon as I uh, got to hear about your background because it was like, oh man, I was there too, man. So <laughs> yeah. that, was, that was cool. But um, I want to thank you for for your time. And uh, one last question: uh, There are going to be a lot of listeners who just have never experienced the kind of music that you do, or ethnomusicology or any of it if they if you wanted to give them a taste of something you're interested in what's the one thing you would point them in that's pretty accessible and would give people maybe a uh, maybe a hunger to learn more as far as uh text or listening i don't care whatever you'd like to whatever you'd like to point people at well, if they're the if they're interested in hearing my music, it most of it streams online for free at jeffkaiser.com. Okay. As far as uh, texts, I think that there are actually two classic texts on ethnomusicology, which are a little old-fashioned but are really kind of wonderful. One is "How Musical Is Man," by uh, John Blacking with a sexist title, but it was you know different. Mm-hmm. Day as a series of lectures, and the other is Towards an Anthropology of Music by Alan Miriam. Right. Uh, both of those are just, just were very influential texts. But, uh, you know, there's some good ones out there. David Borgo's book has nice uh, sections of ethnomusicology, uh, ethnography-driven scholarship, as does, uh, you know, George Lewis, I don't think, is considered an ethnomusicologist in some areas, but I, I consider him one. And his book on the AACM is uh, a tour de force of critical examination as well as uh, interesting histories. And, uh, you know, it's just a wonderful text. Sure. And can people uh, get access to your dissertation online somewhere? You know, um, not right now they can't. It's going to be available soon, but I'm hoping to have the rewritten version out before then. So, all right. Well, when that yeah. happens, let me know and I'll pass it along to all, the, to all the folks on the other end of the line here. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Darwin. Have a great day. Bye. And there's another podcast in the bag. Thanks again to Jeff for his uh, willingness to kind of subject himself to my goofy questions. It was a lot of fun, though. Um, if you want to check out his work, again, you can uh, eyeball it at jeffkaiser.com. And if you want to look into his label, P.F. Mentum, uh, that is pfmentum.com, P-F-M-E-N-T-U-M.com. Uh, Really interesting stuff, kind of all over the map, but in a way that sort of embraces one aesthetic, which is that of experimentalism and improvisation for the sake of the embrace. So again, I want to thank everybody for listening. I want to thank um, Libsyn for their hosting. Uh, I want to thank Cycling74 for being uh, 
both a great employer and for being very supportive of the podcast. Uh, thanks, Syntopia, uh, Create Digital Music, and all the other sites that help spread the word, uh, not only on the podcast, but on the whole genre. And But mostly I want to thank you for listening. Hope to see you next week. If you have any questions, drop me a line, ddg at cycling74.com. Catch you later.